Welcome to the preaching and teaching series of House on the Rock, Lagos, Nigeria. We believe that as you listen to God's Word, you will receive understanding, hope, and faith to become all that God wants you to be. Something is about to happen in your life. And now, here is Pastor Paul and a Pharisee. Romans 13, from verse 11 to verse 14, I read in your hearing from verse 11, which is where the beginning of the word, beginning of the reading starts. And that knowing the time, knowing the kairos, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, it's almost ending. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Look with me at the first two verses of that passage, verse 11 and 12. And knowing that the kairos, which is a window of opportunity in the unfolding of time, which is different from chronos, that now it is high time. Somebody say high time. It is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation, our deliverance, our destiny, nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, and the day or the light is at hand. Hmm. I, I want you to look for about five people and tell them, wake up. <laughs> the night is over, wake up. Yeah. What I mean to tell you is that there is a giant inside of you. There is a mighty woman inside of you, ladies. There is a mighty man inside of you. And the person that you are on the inside is much bigger than you are aware of, much bigger than your mirror tells you, much bigger than your, your present attainments have told you. There is a, a better mother, a, a bigger minister, a bigger CEO, a bigger provider, a bigger leader, a bigger general inside of you, much bigger than you are aware of. And my job this morning is to come and wake him or her up, almighty oh one, that you may arise to your task and to what God called you to be. You may look four feet tall when you look in the mirror, but I, I sense that there are people who are 40 and 50 feet tall on the inside. You're much bigger than your Goliaths. You're much bigger than your Pharaohs, Moses. You're much bigger than your Nebuchadnezzar's Daniel. You're much bigger uh, than your enemies, Gideon. There's a giant in you. And I know it sounds a little highfalutin to you right now, but it sounded highfalutin to me too 20 years ago, 28 years ago, 27 years ago, when people began to tell me what they could sense, when prophetic voices and prophetic people began to tell me what they could sense about me. And likewise, freely I have received, freely I give to you this morning. And I sense that I, I pastor not only individuals who are giants, but I'm aware that they are giants, but we pastor a church that's a little flock, but you have no idea that you are, you are a giant in waiting. Getting ready to storm the land with the power of the kingdom of God, armed with the gospel of grace and truth to do damage to all the enemy's installations in the land. With that in mind, my message title this morning is simply, Wake Up the Mighty Men. Slap three or four people a high five, tell them, wake up. <laughs> Father, bless this time, bless this moment. Do with it what you want to do. Let heaven and earth kiss and collide in bountiful glory. That everybody who experiences this kiss of heaven and earth will leave out of this building empowered, emboldened, encouraged, edified, and your name be glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. And the people of God said a big amen. You may be seated in God's presence. There is a mighty man inside you, men. 
Ladies, there is a mighty warrior of a woman on the inside of you. You are a giant and you don't even know it. There's a much bigger person inside of you than you are aware of. Much bigger. A much better singer. A much bigger artist. A much bigger general. A much bigger CEO. A much bigger provider. A much bigger mother. A much bigger father. A much bigger preacher. A much bigger mentor. A much bigger leader inside of you than you are aware of. And my job this morning is I have come to wake the giant up. But as we progress through the chapter to our verse, the first thing Paul tells us in the opening verse was that we must learn to be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power, no authority, except that which is given of God. That means that the powers that be are ordained of God. Now in Christendom, we find it very contrary to support leaders who we didn't vote for. However, this is an error in manner because the Bible enjoins us to submit. That means literally to support those who are in power regardless of the fact that they didn't get there on your vote. But they got there on God's permission. If they got there, God allowed them to get there. Even if they cheated their way in, God allowed them to get there. And you have to trust God that if he allowed them to get there, he will work all things together for the good of his people regardless of who he allows to be in power. Now, you may contend with this, but please recognize that this letter was written to Christians in Rome. And the civic and public leaders in Rome were men of pagan orientation, heathen. Their leaders were the Herods, the Tetrarchs, the Caesars. These were sun worshipers. These were gods given to mythological beliefs in plurality or pantheons of deities. And yet, St. Paul enjoins the Roman church and the Roman Christians to submit to delegated or designated civic authority. And he goes on to tell us in the fourth verse that they are ministers of God unto us for good. Leadership is ministry. Leadership is ministry. Leaders go first. They lead by example. They bite the bullet. They take the bullet in our place. I take many bullets for you as your leader. And don't think that the folk that are shooting at me won't shoot at you if they could see you. If I stepped out of the way, they would criticize you, scrutinize you, look at how many cars you have and what you do and everything else too. But because I'm in front of you, they target me and not you. But if I stepped outside of the way, you would be the target. When my father died over 20 years ago, I started feeling a breeze on my forehead, a sharp breeze, a painful breeze on my forehead that I never felt all the days of his life. Because once he was out of the way, the battles and struggles that he faced on our behalf, I had to begin to deal with. I also felt a breeze in my back, an impetus of grace pushing me that I couldn't feel before. But I also tell you that I had trouble to deal with in the front. Are you with me? Because ministry or service is leadership. Leadership is ministry. Ministry or service can only be fruitful if the minister ministers with a love for his constituency or for his people. Paul tells us a little further in the 8th verses going forward to about the 10th uh, about the law and its 10 commandments, but reduces all of that law into two simple commandments. Love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, treat people the way you want to be treated. Treat people the way you treat yourself. Love yourself and then you're well equipped to love others too. Love is not puffed up. Love is never about you. Love is, is something that never fails. Love is always about the other person. It's always about the recipient, not the giver. Lust is about you, where you come to get what you want because you want it. But love is about helping somebody else, loving somebody else, and Paul tells us to do it from the heart. Because trying to obey Ten Commandments will always provoke a resistance from the human being and from its flesh. But when you simply just tell people to do it from the heart, it's easier to be compliant. Glory to God, I'll make it simple in a few moments. When somebody loves you, it is a ministry. Look at two or three people, tell them I love you. And watch how they smile. They're tickled. <laughs> they already feel better about themselves because somebody said, I love you. Have you ever dated a young lady before and you contemplated when you should say those magical three words and the moment you said it, she started to... 
she lost her breath. That somebody loved, and then you almost lost your breath when she said, I love you too. Because love is ministry. It is ministry. I, I went away for, for a few days to try and get some rest and recuperation and to spend time training my own biological children and have time to bond with them. And um, I rushed back into the country after a grueling uh, weekend of, of service in the UK church and then got on the plane Monday morning, arrived Monday night, had to be at a communion service which was well ordered, well ordained, well designed, well put together for a close friend of mine who's a member of this church and has been from its inception. And it was well tailored to and well put together and he had an interesting compendium of guests who came from the upper echelons of various sectors in our marketplace, including his own industry, the oil and gas. And we went to town and we stood behind him very significantly and came out in our clerical collars because we understood that there would be people of different religious persuasions there, including uh, the various arms and facets of Christianity. And we wanted to turn it on and we turned it on and we went out to minister and it came to my part to do my part of ministry, which was to teach the word and to break the bread and share share the word uh, before we officiated the communion and I did the very best I knew how to do and having done what we did you could sense God's presence come down into the room in a powerful way because when you talk about God as to who he really is and what he's really like God will run into the room and undress himself and show you his naked power and bring forth his glory in a room and the glory started to touch various people there who because of all kinds of propaganda were kind of closed to Paul Adifaras's ministry um, and you know how the high and mighty tend to be sometimes, and they were quite shut down. And there's one particular fellow, I think his nickname is Mr. White, and I won't tell you anything else about his, his, his identity so that you, don't, you know, don't know who I'm talking about. And I'd meet him from time to time, and he was kind of close to me and didn't, didn't act like he ever thought anything of me. And in fact, he was quite condescending in his attitude and manner to me for the few years I've known of him because he's a friend of another friend. And um, he said to our host that I have to admit that was an incredible service, you know, people came out of there walking sideways and on top of the world and feeling all kind of good and that that pastor is something else he's really awesome he's this is that is that I wanted to actually go up and shake his hand after the communion uh, but I didn't want him to get cocky <laughs> and then another person called and said that was just completely off the hook I've never heard that kind of interpretation before these are not trained believers like you and I these are people who are, uh, you know, a little off the fence, some. Uh, and I'm talking about people who control the industry of oil and gas and the industry of marketing, banking, and finance. And, and the list of people who came in with all their, their comments and their positive uh, commendations and all of that, I got to tell you, it was ministry to me. <laughs> It was ministry to me because when anybody says they like you or the evidence that they like you, it is ministry. It is ministry. When somebody loves you, it is ministry. And people can't love unless they love themselves first. Because you don't know how to love me until you know how to love you. And in order to fulfill your destiny, you're going to need ministry. And ministry means you've got to learn to surround yourself with people who like you, who love you, who, who have some mutual admiration for you. People who think you're the bomb. Who, people who think you got it going on. Otherwise, if you have the opposite, it suppresses your gift. It suppresses your confidence. It suppresses your self-worth. And without a good sense of self-worth, you can't really operate your gift and come into your destiny. Love is a good thing to have. I want you to try it. Look for two or three people that are telling them, I love you. Look, the atmosphere in the room has already changed. The ladies are laughing, especially the ladies, because you know they're emotional. And when you tell a lady that you love her, oh, <laughs> love, love is ministry. Love is ministry. It really is ministry. It is ministry. And, and when, when you are loved, you do better. When somebody loves you, it is a ministry. Remember when you were a child and you had a high fever and mama was at work? And when she, she heard, she rushed home from work at 2, 2 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. And up until 2 p.m. when they brought you back from, from school at 10 a.m., you were under the care of the nanny. And the nanny didn't really care about you. She was just working for a paycheck. She was still shouting at you in your fever and left you in your same clothes in your fever. But when mama comes home, she says, oh, my lovely goochie boochie 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 Oh, who did this to you? And then mom comes and she puts, she puts the back of her hand very gently in the crevice between your neck and your jaw uh, to feel your temper. Oh, you're going to be all right, my lovey dooby-doo. 
And just, just that one motion, you already begin to feel better, that, that somebody who loves you is around. She says, I'll be right back. And she goes down into the kitchen, and she brings out the edge also, starts to broil it a little bit, and puts the ifri and the atarere together, and starts cooking on some pepper soup for you. And before long, the aroma of the pepper soup begins to waft up through the kitchen and into the living area, and then up, up the stairs into your bedroom, and you know God's cooking up a healing for you. He's cooking up a remedy for you, and before a few minutes have turned into 10 minutes mama's up the stairs and she's got a bowl of pepper soup and some nicely toasted brown bread with the edges cut off and before she gives it to you on the tray she gets two pillows and props your back up and then gets two more pillows from your brother's bed and that's not good enough she gets two more from your daddy's bed so that you're sitting up nicely and mama's got you and she's taking care of the thermostat on the thermometer on the thermostat on the air conditioning just to make sure everything is nice for her coochie 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 boo doo doo then she serves you the pepper soup. She doesn't let you serve it yourself. She serves you each spoon. By the third spoon, how you feel? I'm fine, mama. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Mama was not even a doctor. And it wasn't the pepper soup that cured you, nor the chloroquine either. It was mama's love. <laughs> love is a ministry. Love is a ministry. I command the husbands, love your wives. I command the wives what your husband gives you, give it back to him. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Your house will become a powerhouse, a place of possibility, a place where dreams are fulfilled, where destiny is actualized. Yeah, if you're sitting next to your husband, tell him God said, love me. Love me. When somebody likes you, it is ministry. When I got all those phone calls from near and far about Tuesday's communion service and how powerful it was and how this was and how that was, I started to feel taller. The giant in me started to stand up. I started to feel like an archbishop. <laughs> God does not send ministry to people who do not have a destiny. And when I look back over my life, I realized that God didn't just send any old person to minister to me. He sent the very best throughout the entire nearly three decades of my Christian growth. He sent me the best. He put great ministry on me because he doesn't send great ministry to people with no destiny. When you want to build a two-story house, you just get a contractor and they come with their commande, 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 poco, and their paki, and their quicker. And they just lay the cement, build the blocks, and build. But when you want to build the rock cathedral, you, you're going to use about three long, tall cranes because you, you, don't, you don't send great ministry to no destiny. When you have a great destiny, God's going to send you great ministry. Have you not taken time to just look back? Whether it's music, he's given you the very best. Whether it's conferences, he's given you the very best. When you look at the team of leaders that God has equipped this house with as ministers to you, you must understand that you have a great destiny. Otherwise, God would not have sent you this great ministry. You don't revive anything that you're not going to use. You don't fix anything that you're not going to use. You don't refresh anything that you're not going to use. God sends great ministry to people who have great destiny. Jesus is about to step into the real purpose of his destiny. And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane contemplating a terrible decision, which if he made the wrong decision, he would short circuit his entire destiny. And the decision had taken so much out of him that he was weakened and he needed to be strengthened. And God himself sent him ministry from an angel who appeared to him strengthening him because he had a great destiny that he was about to come into. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I came to tell you, just like Jesus, you can't die here. Oh, you didn't hear me, so let me preach it some more. I know you're catching hell. I know you're catching flack. I know you feel like quitting. I know you feel like giving up. I know you've been through shame and pain and hell and high water. And you feel like you ought to give up. You feel like you ought to throw in the towel. You feel like you ought to quit. But I come to tell you, you can't die here. 
and to prevent you from dying, God's going to keep giving you ministry. Some of us would have died if we weren't getting the kind of ministry we keep getting every Sunday, every Wednesday, every year, every year in, every year out. It's the ministry that's kept us alive because God still has plans for you. You ain't going to die here. This is not the last chapter in your storybook. There's still better chapters in front of you. The chapters behind are nothing to be compared with the chapters in front. That's why God keeps strengthening you with great ministry because you have a destiny. Now, if you don't have a destiny, please stitch your two lips together. Look collectible and calm and keep looking at me like as if I'm giving you a homily. But the rest of you, I want you to look for five people as you get up out of your chair and tell them, I do have a destiny. I feel like quitting, I feel like giving up, I feel like giving in, but I do have a destiny. I feel like a nobody, but I do have a destiny. I look like a derelict, like a destitute, but I do have a destiny. What do I mean by I do have a destiny? I mean that you haven't seen the best of me yet. I mean that whilst I may look like a dwarf right now, there's a giant in me who's getting ready to burst out of Kent Clark like the Incredible Hulk. I mean that you are about to see something explode on you your horizon because I am about to happen. I have a destiny. I want you to slap three more people a high five. Tell them I have a destiny. I have a destiny. I have a destiny. You cannot die here because you have a destiny. One lady came up to me after one of the Expo Center services and said, I love this ministry. I love your word. I love your message. Pastor, I just feel so awesome. You could see her exhilarated by what, had, what impact she had undertaken during the service. And she said, but I said, do you come to us at Muson? She said, no, I won't come to Muson. But anytime you're here, I'll be here. I said, why don't you come to Musa? I said, oh, there's too much parking problem. It's too long. Sometimes we have to wait outside for an hour before we get in there. I looked back at her. I said, you don't want anything bad enough. Because when you want something bad enough, you don't care how many hours you have to wait for it. You don't care how much traffic you have to wait through. You don't care whether you have to drive from Ibad or to Lekki just to get good ministry. Because you recognize that I have a destiny to fuel. I have a future to feed. I have a dream to actualize. And I need to nourish it with good ministry. I want to ask you something. You do have a destiny. How bad do you want it? The thing that's going to make a difference between where you are and you actualizing your destiny has everything with you ensuring that you attain or that you receive qualitative great ministry. That's what we're dedicated to. That's what we've designed our lives to be and do according to God's mandate upon us. Because if you want something bad enough, you'll go out of your way to fuel it. For 2,500 naira an hour, which equates to a 5 million naira a year pay packet, some people in this room will get up at 4.30 or 4 o'clock every morning, prepare their husband's house, iron their children's clothes, iron their husband's suits, get themselves in and out of the and dress, make breakfast for everybody, and be up and out of the house to drive from Iria Kari to their job on Victoria Island just because of a pay packet. 52 weeks in a year where that they have to serve 250 working days in a year just for a pay packet. How much more when you have a great destiny? It doesn't matter that I have to drive from Ibadan to Lekki. doesn't matter that I have to wait for parking and for the folk in first service to get out and for that long-winded preacher to finish his lengthy sermon. It doesn't matter that I have to uh, share, share two seats between three people. When I have a destiny to feed and a future to fuel, I'll do whatever I have to do in order order to attain my destiny. I'll wait through the traffic. I'll wait through the first service. I'll endure the long walk from the parking lot. I'll get there an hour before the service begins because I've got to get ministry for my destiny. You know, the church growth consultants have sat with us as we contemplate moving into the Millennium Temple, and they've said a few things to me. They said, first of all, you've got to have plenty of parking. So we've done that. He says, second, your services need to be short like an hour and 15 minutes, because I, I'm looking to grow this church to 50,000 members. That's my objective. And that's not the end. That's a means to its end. The 50,000 is a means to its end. Um, and they said, you, 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 you can shout, but don't shout too much. <laughs> if you want the right kind of people to show up, don't shout too much. I said, I, I'll try to do my best, but you can't stop me from shouting if I feel something pushing me in the back. 
I'll try to keep it short sometimes. You know, I'll try to give you parking. I'll try to do the service and the homily all in 45 minutes or one hour or something like that. I'll do my best. But I want to remind you, sirs, I've seen soccer fans that are fans of Chelsea and soccer fans that are fans of Arsenal. I've seen them park their car two miles from the Emirates Stadium and from Stanford Bridge and from Theater of Dreams, the Man U fans, and then watch them go by the pub, get drunk first, then walk an hour in a skewed line or two hours to the Stanford Bridge or, or to the Emirates Stadium or to the Theater of Dreams and get there an hour before game time just so they could get a good seat because to them, the soccer match is ministry. Oh, you don't want to help me. And then, and then they patiently wait, singing songs already in service before the match begins. And then the match begins and they're concentrated. And they endure one and a half hours of game time. And then the 15 minutes in between. And if it's a goalless draw and there's no progress, no development, no attainment, and it's equal, then they'll wait for stoppage time. When stoppage time is done. They'll wait some more without complaining for the first bit of extra time, the second bit of extra time. And if the referee insists on more extra time, they wait without, in fact, they don't want it to end. Then if it's still a goalless draw or an equal draw, they'll wait for the penalties. And after penalties have decided who the winner is, they'll wait for the trophy time. How much more, hear me, child of God, over just a football being kicked into a netted goal, how much more those of us who have received the abundance of grace and the gift of free salvation, would we not be willing to park wherever we need to park, walk wherever we need to walk from, get there sometime earlier and be there as long as it takes to get real ministry for our great destiny? Maybe you don't realize that your destiny is predicated on the ministry you receive. That's what feeds your destiny. That's what fuels your future. Don't take what you're getting this morning for granted. That's the courage that you need to make it through those walls. It's the ministry from Samuel that gave David the courage to make it through, through Saul. Hear me what I'm saying to you. I'm amazed how when people want something bad enough, they do anything to get it. I want to go to America. I want to go to Holland. I want to get Schengen. And they go to a lake crescent. They wake up at 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. to pray for three hours. Then they leave the house at 4.30 a.m. or 5 a.m. early in the morning to get to a Lake Crescent by 5 o'clock to make sure they're first in line. And they take nonsense from every kind of person. Before the Oimbos come, the ordinary, ordinary security guard said, this is American Embassy. All your titles, chief, doctor, engineer, we don't use it here, just write Mr. You see, big men and small men are like CEOs, billionaires, mm, everybody's the same at the Lake Crescent. Because when you want something bad enough, you humble yourself. I remember the Bible said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. Oh, the way you're laughing, it seems like you also want to go to America. <laughs> That whilst you're waiting for you know you endure so much just to go to America. You will get your visa today. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Those are the beggars that capitalize on your prolonged presence on the benches at a Lake Crescent. Then the Oimbos now arrive after you've been waiting there for four hours. And they start driving into the gate. You know, okay, the time is near. Let me behave myself. You start checking all your papers. Is everything all right? Then they call for you. And then, big as you are, that <laughs> I see you when you come to service. I won't sit there. Uh, uh, don't you know who I am? I'm a pillar of this church. I won't sit there. But when the book comes, you see, this is what you do. From, from chair to chair. From chair to chair. From chair to chair. Then in the house of God, you are making shakara. Slap two people a high five, say shame on you. Yeah. 
say, don't you know who I am, that I should be sharing two chairs between three people? Am I one third of a person? Yet, at a Lake Crescent. For just to go to another man's country. What about your destiny? When you really want something bad enough, you'll go out of your way to get it. Some of you, your enemies been attacking you since before you were born, whilst you were in your mother's womb. They tried to abort you from the womb. Then you were born. They tried to kill you in the crib, in the cot, so you almost suffered a, a crib death or a cot death. Then you became an infant and you were molested as a child. Then you became a teen and you were abused as a teenager. Uh, in your adulthood, you've come through so many near-death accidents and incidents that came against your life. The devil did anything he could find. He used anything he could try to mess you up early. Why? Because even hell knows that you do have a destiny to fulfill. If you don't believe it, say nothing. But if you do, I want you to slap three people a high five and tell them, I do have a destiny. I do have a destiny. I do have a destiny. How do you know you have a destiny? Because something keeps tugging at me and tells me I'm more than meets the eye. Something keeps pulling at me. Something keeps reminding me that I cannot end here. It makes you uncomfortable about things you're stuck in that are not good for you. It makes you uncomfortable with things that you're doing that are iniquitous and counterproductive to your destiny. Look at somebody. Tell them I have a destiny. Yeah, it won't let me rest at night because I have a destiny. It won't let me, let me date Johnny anymore because I have a destiny. It won't let me date Janie anymore because I have a destiny. It won't let me run with the old crew that made me smoke and chew and do the things that others do uh, because I have a destiny. It won't let me go back to the nightclub or to those drinking bodies because I have a destiny. I can't do what I used to do before. I'm now uncomfortable doing what I used to do before. That's how I know I have a destiny. No wonder the devil is trying to sabotage you with attacks. He wants to seduce you with diversions, divert you with distractions, ensnare you with obsessions, enslave you with addictions, hold you in bondage to unbelief, grip you with fear and doubt. But when he comes like that, you have to refuse it. I want to take you back to your bad habits, your bad ways, your bad friends, your bad cliques, your bad clubs. And, and then if he can't do that, he'll try and stain you with the memory of what you got wrong. He'll try and raise accusations and aspersions over your bad history. All because he doesn't want you to come into your destiny. But you have to learn whether it's an obsession an addiction, a perversion, a seduction, a diversion, or a distraction. You have to sh shake it off. They lied about you, but the lie came from people who are well believed. You have to sh shake it off. You hear me what I'm saying? You cannot be a progressive person if you don't know how to shake yourself. Slap two people a high five, tell them you better shake yourself now. You can't be a progressive person if you live in the rear view of your life. Always looking at what could have been, looking back at what should have been, what ought to have been, who I could have married, who I should have married, what could have happened if I did this, that, or the other, if, or if I had known better. You can't live there. Because those are opportunities that you messed up, they are done and gone. But you have a future in front of you. The past you can never retrieve, nor can you fix it, but the future you can fix. And that means you need to shake yourself free of some stuff. Look at somebody, tell them, shake yourself. Shake, yourself. shake it off. I remember some strong leaders of the church, some years ago when I was getting ready to start this, they told me it'll be a flash in the pan, that it won't work. One week later, it was working. Two weeks later, it was still working. Two months later, it was still working. One year later, it was working. Five years later, it was still working. Some years later, it overtook them. Still working. 20 years later, it dwarfed them. It's still working. You know why? Because I learned early from people who gave me good ministry, shake it off. 
Whatever's holding you back, shake it off. Sometimes it's your spouse or your house that says something that's a fiery dart that half kills your momentum and your propulsion. You've got to know how to shake it off. I want you to preach to three people and say it my way. Shake it off. Shake it off. St. Paul said it this way. Not as if I had already attained, either were already perfect. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are in front, I press forward toward the mark, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm aiming at my destiny. I can't help what I used to be, but I sure enough can help what I can be. I was listening to Margaret Thatcher the other day in her movie, and she said, I really like America. Because here in Britain, we build our institutions on what has been and what used to be and on our history. And we prize our history as our philosophy. But I like the American sense of philosophy. They build their philosophy on what can be, what we can do, what we haven't done yet that we are able to do. Not on what happened. You were a loser, yes. But doesn't mean you have to stay a loser. You were a flunky, yes, but doesn't mean you have to stay a flunky. You were obsessed with addictions and bad behavior, but it doesn't mean you have to be that. I had to learn how to shake it off. Because when strong men tell you that you are a failure and you are not going to happen, you have to know that the Bible says, let every man be a liar and let God alone be true. <clears throat> and we know what God thinks about your future. He said, I know the plans, the designs. In other words, this is well through, thought through planning and scheming. I know the plans that I have for you, plans of good and not evil, to give you a destiny. You hear what I'm saying? When you have a destiny to fuel, you want great ministry. You know, my friends, the night season of your life is almost over. St. Paul said it in our text. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. The night is a difficult time. That's when things are not working and you can't work. It's a time when you can't see clearly if you can see anything at all. You can't see your way out. You can't see your way through. You can't see your way over. You can't see how to, who to, with, how, when, what. You, you can't see well. The night is also a time when you're wearied, you're tired, you're sleepy, you're fatigued with life and its many battles. You've been over inundated and overwhelmed for too long and now the night has set in. And the worst thing is when you're in your night season, which may not be the same season for somebody else, people tend to define you by first impressions. My old Jamaican mother says it this way. She made us dress sharp and look sharp because she says first impressions last forever. People tend to define you by the first impression. They tend to define you by how they met you. They met you drowsy. They met you drugged up. They met you in the night. They met you sleeping. They met you when you were a nobody. They met you after you were traumatized by your first divorce or by the loss of your first husband. They met you exhausted from battle. They met you tired. They met you lonely. They met you disgusted. They met you empty. They met you spent. They met you overwhelmed. They met you in the night when they couldn't see clearly and you couldn't see clearly. And you know the worst thing about people is they like you at night when you're a nobody because it makes them feel better about themselves. That you're in your night and, and there's something special. But the moment you start waking up, the moment you start stretching, the moment you start turning around in your sleep and making signs that the giant in you is about to wake up, they start getting upset. Because they don't like the idea that a better you, a bigger you, a stronger you, a giant you is about to arise. Look at somebody, if you hear me, what I'm saying, and say, neighbor, don't you dare define me by how you met me. Because you met me at night. And I want to announce to you, neighbor, that that season of my life is about to come to an end. In other words, neighbor, you better buckle your seatbelt, pull out your tent pegs, enlarge your borders, and get ready because something is about to happen in my life. You have no idea what God is about to release in my life. 
Oh, you don't hear me what I'm saying to you. The giant is already stirring in his bed. The giant warrior, the giant CEO, the giant provider, the giant preacher, the giant doctor, the giant hospital proprietor, the giant businesswoman is stirring about to arise. Oh, look at somebody tell him he's talking about me right now. And the worst thing about it, Dr. Amushon, is when you're about four foot eight tall or five foot four, and your opposition and competition are eight foot and six feet, they try to look down on you as if you were a pygmy. Because they think that everything is in the natural that everything is what meets the eye. But help me and tell somebody, there is much more to me than what meets the eye. I think you preached it a couple of Sundays ago. It does not yet appear what we be, but when we see him as he is, we be like him. Slap somebody a high five, tell them I'm about to appear. Tell another person the real me is about to show up. Tell a third person the sleeping giant is about to arise. Oh my God, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in this room. This Sunday morning, something is about to burst. Something is about to break. The flood tides are about to give way. The gates are about to open up. Something is about to happen. Slap somebody a high five and tell them there's more to me than meets the eye. Tell your second neighbor there's a giant in me. I don't know if you hear me what I'm saying to you, but I didn't come to teach this morning. I didn't come to preach either. I didn't come to give you a nice homily. I came to blow a trumpet in Zion and to sound an alarm on God's holy mountain, uh, to wake up the mighty men, to call all the men of war, to draw near, to beat their plowshares into saws and their pruning hooks into spears, to tell the giants of House on the Rock to wake up. Wake up. Wake up out of your sleep. Wake up out of your slumber. Wake up out of your trouble. Wake up from your obsessions. Wake up out of your iniquity and your sins. Wake up out of the sins that easily beset you. Wake up! I said, wake up! Oh, help me to preach. I'm running out of breath. Look for five people. Slap them a high five. Point your finger in their face and tell them, wake up! Don't waste your destiny, wake up. Don't waste your future, wake up. Don't waste your possibilities, wake up. Don't give up on your tomorrow, wake up. You don't seem to realize it yet. You are bigger than your task. David, you are stronger than your trouble. You are bigger than your situation. You are taller than your circumstance. You are stronger than your enemy. You are bigger than your struggle. You are mightier than your Goliath. Here's that little boy, David. Tiny little boy. Tiny of age. Tiny of expertise. Tiny of years. Tiny in size. Against a giant who his whole nation was afraid of. But David had been getting good ministry. He'd been getting good ministry. Samuel had been ministering to him. God Almighty had been ministering to David. David had a deep sense of destiny. See, you can have a destiny, but if you don't have ministry, you lose the acute awareness of the destiny. And when you don't believe that you have what you have, you're never really going to actualize what you do have because you don't believe you have it. But ministry helps you believe that you have it. And ministry is not just one-on-one, -on -one, it's also corporate because the power of agreement accentuates your belief in what is often difficult to believe. God's going to do the unbelievable with you. You didn't hear me. Let me try over here. I said, God is going to do the unbelievable with you. I said, God is going to do the unbelievable. What we're doing today at Expo Center, at the cathedral here in Lagos, at the TBS, if you told me that we were going to do this 25 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 10 years ago, I would never have believed it. I had no idea that there was a giant in this broken boy. But because you know, and I know, because you see the giant today, I feel every bit of authority to tell you there's a giant in you. There's a giant in you. Maybe a sleeping giant, but he's a giant nonetheless. Maybe a discouraged giant, but he's a giant nonetheless. Maybe a weary giant, but he's still a giant. Maybe a giant you are unaware of, but he is still a giant in you. And little David knew he was bigger than Goliath. Because if God be with you, who is bigger than you? Little Daniel knew he was bigger than Nebuchadnezzar. Little Mordecai knew he was bigger than Haman. Little Moses knew he was bigger than Pharaoh. 
40 years of being nothing. 40 years of, of suffering the deep effects of trauma from colossal failure. Yet he got ministry from the theophanic manifestation of God himself. And when God ministered to him, he actualized his destiny. You hear what I'm saying? This Sunday morning, God told me to tell you, wake up. Wake up! That's what he told me to tell you, wake up. Ladies, wake up. Businessmen, wake up. Businesswomen, wake up. Preachers, HODs, ministry directors, get out of your sleep, wake up! Stop fretting and wake up. Stop complaining and wake up. Stop groaning and murmuring, wake up. Stop crying and fooling around, wake up. Stop doubting. Stop getting drunk, wake up. Stop fornicating. Stop committing adultery, wake up. Stop feeding, feeding your, your failure, wake up. Stop feeling sorry for yourself, wake up. And this is the context in which he said you should wake up. And knowing the kairos, knowing the time, Kairos is an interesting word, Brother Femi. It, it is different from the word chronos, which means the unfolding of time. Chronos is where we get the word chronometer, chronology from, which speaks of the passing of time. But kairos is different, and the Greeks were specific in their language. Kairos is a moment in chronos, where opportunity is heightened, but it is like a window that opens for a time and then shuts when that time is over. So Kairos is a period of time within the larger unfolding of time, which means simply put that opportunities of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity, meaning that the opportunity won't be there forever. So whilst the opportunity is alive, you must seize it. Look at somebody, tell them, I'm going to take my moment. I'm going to have it. <laughs> and St. Paul tells us that, that it is a Kairos moment but he heightens his statement and says, knowing the kairos, that now it is high time. High time, my friends, is not the same thing as time. I, I, have, I have an alarm clock, and you know, this morning I needed to be up. I went to sleep at about 1 a.m. in the morning, and I figured four hours of sleep would help me to be ready for the work I have to do with you. And so I brought out my BB. And I set my BB to 5, 5 o'clock or 5.15, something like that. And, you know, my BB has a nice melody for the first 10, 15 seconds. It's a sweet melody. It's very soothing. But if you ignore it after 20 seconds, wah, 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 <laughs> it's nauseating. It's irritating. And so, so after the first, I reached and I pressed the snooze button. And it assured me quiet and peace for another five minutes, which to me felt like this will be an eternity. But the eternity didn't last a second. I hit the snooze button again. I must have hit the snooze button about eight times. And by the eighth time, I already saw terrible visions of me rushing into church in my pajamas with one half of my beard unshaven, my clothes not properly kept, trying to muster up a message because I knew that it was now nearly six o'clock and it was high time. If I wasn't up shaving, showering, putting my last thoughts together, getting my prayer in, I would be a hopeless wreck trying to deliver a, a, a message or an alarm to the people. Can I tell you what God showed me? Too many of you are still on snooze. And there's no more snooze time left. It is now high time. If you don't get up now, you might lose the job. If you don't get up now, you might misplace the destiny. If you don't get up now, it'll be another 10 years, perhaps, before destiny's opportunity comes back again. And in 10 years, you won't be the same person with the same strength that you are now. You'll be much older, possibly much weaker, possibly much di more, more disappointed, possibly a lot more bitter and a lot more choked out in terms of your possibilities. That's why you must seize it now. I just want to take a few moments and preach to you and tell you the night is almost over.
That season when you can't see who you're going to be. You can't tell what your future is going to be like. That season when you can't see your way out or see your way through. It's almost over. In a few moments, you're going to be able to see clearly who you shall be, what you shall be, what you can do, where you can go, what you will have, what you do have. Because the night is almost over. That means you can't stay in bed any longer. You can't stay with Janie or Jamie or Janice anymore. That season is over. Whatever you've got to do, wake up. Whatever you need to do to wake up, you've got to do it and do it now. If you have to wait in the parking lot for an hour before you get to service, then wait. If you have to drive for a longer distance an hour and now pay a toll, pay it. If you have to humble yourself to sit with two other people in two chairs, then do it. If you have to fast and pray and study and learn obedience on new levels, then do it. Let me tell you what God showed me. He showed me hundreds of giants who thought they were pygmies, just sleep. Yet a whole generation was depending on them. Yet great mansions, great real estate, great prowess, great possibility awaited them. But they had no idea that they were giants. When they looked in the mirror, they saw pygmies. But when we looked at them, we saw giants. My friends, when you hit the snooze button, it means you want to go back to what you were comfortable with. It means you want to go back to being drunk. You want to go back to being silly. You want to go back to the dope. You want to go back to the fornication. You want to go back to the illicit behavior. You want to go back to your obsessions and your bad habits. I want you to lift up your hands and shout, God, wake me up. It's high time. It's high time. If you use the snooze button again, you might miss your moment. It's high time. I'm not out of message, but I'm out of time. Thank you for making our time to listen to this message. For additional information of this and other ministry products by Pastor Paul Adefarasi, please contact us on 01 461 4120 or 01 461 4135 or by email to info at houseontherock.org.ng. You can also visit our website on www.houseontherock.org.ng. We invite you to one of our regular services on Sundays by 7.15 a.m., 9.15 a.m., and 11.30 a.m., and Wednesdays by 6 p.m. All our meetings hold at the Muson Center, Unicorn, Lagos. God bless you.